This video presents an example construction sectional drawing configuring a sawtoothed roofing system with north facing glazing. This should be uh, your role model for an assignment that you will be given to design a sawtooth roof with south facing glazing. So far you've learned that the daylight system and the view glazing are generally different. Uh, for example, we put uh, daylight glazing up higher to allow deeper penetration of light into the building. Um, view glazing tends to be lower and present a really good view of the horizon line because that's where most of the interesting views are. And generally what works well for daylighting doesn't necessarily work very well for view and vice versa. For example, in the case of view, we have to be able to see through it, but in the case of daylight glazing, we might make it diffusing to scatter the light around. This is one example. This is a wall daylighting system at the perimeter of an office building. Another example that we've talked about is this gymnasium where you'll notice all the view glazing is close to the horizon. It's been protected with greenery and overhangs. And then these openings in the roof are to provide daylight. Another thing that you've learned has to do with sun angles. Um, and we've used that knowledge to come up with some conclusions about how we should orient glazing. And one of the things we've said is that the aperture should be ample in area to collect adequate diffuse skylight. Diffuse skylight is our source, not beam sunlight. And therefore the daylighting apertures should be uh, designed, oriented and protected in such a way that they avoid beam sunlight during the cooling season. And it's not a bad idea if they admit it during the heating season as a way of offsetting some of the heating loads of the building. Uh, we've learned that if we put in vertical glass facing either north or south with a proper overhang, that we can provide uh, adequate daylight with uh, a glazing area that's approximately 20% of the floor area being illuminated. We've also learned that those overhangs are not only crucial, but we have methods of sizing them. So for example, in this case, a south facing sawtooth has an overhang that protects to a profile angle of somewhere between 16 and 24 degrees off of vertical. We've also talked about zones of illumination and I want to make a few more comments on that right at the moment. Um, there are two strategies to doing daylighting. One is called zoning where you can put in a very large aperture. For the example, this is Marbles Museum, which has a huge aperture up here and another fairly significant one uh, on the other side of the building. In this case, they've zoned their activities, so activities that they want to be energetic and noisy and social are in this brightly writ, lit uh, atrium or entry space. And then in the darker recesses are things that are educational in nature where they want to control the light for the purposes of the displays that they're putting up. That's one approach where you are definitely not seeking uniform light. This is the exact opposite. You're trying to illuminate this space as uniformly as possible. And in this case, it's not just down near the task surface as we normally define it. For example, if we were in a classroom, a library space, or an office space, the task surface would be two and a half feet off of the floor here because that's where we put our book or our magazine or our memorandum or whatever it is that we're reading. In this case, the task is a basketball flying through the space and they've done an absolutely beautiful job of uniformly illuminating the entire volume. So this would be an excellent precedent for somebody doing um, a sculpture um, gallery where there might be really large pieces of sculpture that would go up near the top of the volume 
and which need to be illuminated up there would also be very appropriate to uh, a museum uh, for planes. Anything that's three-dimensional that's likely to consume this volume would work well with a system like this. We've put together some guidelines for uh, uniform illumination. Um, for example, right here we have a sawtooth aperture. Uh, it is generally sending light to the left in the view that we have here because that's the direction that the glass is facing. So admitted light comes in this direction. And you'll notice that we have pretty good illumination more or less close to uh, but out in front of this glazing where it peaks out somewhere like this then it diminishes downward and becomes very very uh, minimal towards the back side here it drops even faster on this side because by the time we get to this point there is no direct light from that aperture the only light reaching that point is what's bouncing off of that surface and then it diminishes down very very low in this space. In this space, this portion is even darker than this portion because most of the light is headed in that direction. Now, I've drawn some triangles that are more or less going to about half the light level that we have here. This would be the peak. This is about half, and I've drawn a triangle there. And the key point is to say that this aperture illuminates fairly well in this zone but is pretty weak everywhere else so we're going to call this the primary zone of illumination and these numbers uh, indicate the geometry this line has a slope of one on the vertical 1.5 on the horizontal this one has a slope of one on the vertical and 0.2 on the horizontal now this triangle is based totally, totally on the amount of light that's incident on this test surface from skylight. These angles have absolutely nothing to do with beam sunlight. We're not using beam sunlight as a primary source. We basically said we're focusing on diffuse skylight. If there's beam sunlight there that gives us warmth during the wintertime, that's great. We want to keep it out during the summertime, and whatever we do, we'd like to diffuse it. But right now, we are talking about illumination from our primary source, which is diffuse skylight. So this triangle tells us that relative to diffuse skylight providing illumination through this aperture, this is roughly the zone, the primary zone of illumination. So we show a series of diagrams here. Here we have a couple of widely spaced apertures. And even though there's no space as dark here as what we have up here, this is still very non-uniform. It's very bright right there, very bright right there. And the light level right here is very weak. So the illuminance level here is much greater than the illuminance level there. If we put in three of them, it becomes much better. The really low point in our illuminance is here and there. And we're about at the point where the peak illuminance and the minimal illuminance are about a ratio of two to one. If we put four of them in and space them in this manner, we're starting to get very uniform light where the minimums and the maximums are not very different from each other. And by the way, this occurs when those triangles that we constructed are just touching each other. In other words, if we have a primary zone of illumination from this aperture, we want to slide another aperture up close to it so that the primary zone of illuminance for this aperture touches that one, which touches that one, which touches that one. So this is a geometric construct technique that will allow you to get fairly uniform light. Now, you can try to violate this by putting your apertures further apart. If you do that, you're on your own in the sense of you, the guidelines no longer work for you and you're going to have to do some model testing or computer simulations of your design.
Okay, so this shows taking that construction technique, which by the way is always generated from the top edge of the long linear daylighting aperture. And those lines get constructed down in this manner. And we've shown a building that's been designed so that basically the, the um, primary zones of illumination completely cover the work plane. So we would expect out of this particular design to get very uniform and effective illuminance on this task surface. Now if we wanted to display things up higher, we'd have to move the task plane up higher and then we'd have to have closer apertures in order to get the primary zones of illumination touching each other. And so that's happened here. If I showed the primary zone here, these triangles would overlap each other substantially and the crossover point would be up somewhere high. In other words, we could take our task plane as being way up here and we'd still be getting very uniform light. Okay, this is another example of that. This is the Mount Airy Library uh, where the south-facing apertures with overhangs have been spaced quite close together and as a consequence the light level at the task surface is very uniform. So this gives you an idea of what that space looks like and the illuminance varies only slightly across this task space. Okay, so that's what we know up till now. And now we want to construct a sawtooth roof to meet some sort of standards for structure and lighting, uniformity, and so forth. So the example we're gonna pick is configuring a sawtooth roofing system with north-facing glazing. Um, and we're doing it for a manufacturing facility that's to be built near the coast of eastern North Carolina because the climate is warm and the internal heat generation from the manufacturing processes will be fairly high. We want to minimize the heat gain during, through the day, daylight glazing. Uh, therefore, the decision is made to illuminate the building using north-facing glass and a sawtooth roof. Our alternative would have been south-facing with an overhang but during the swing months that would have overheated because the climate is pretty warm and the internal heat gains are high. And then you add some solar to that and that creates a problem. The north facing sawtooth configuration is also very appealing because it provides a sloped south facing opaque roof surface on which we can mount photovoltaics for generating electricity, which is always helpful when you have a manufacturing facility that's going to have a constant demand for electricity. The activities in the occurring in the building will require free movement up to a height of 22 feet and they will require a column spacing of 40 feet. And this is of course approximate because if the columns get too fat they might need to be further apart. But based on discussions with the client it's uh, assumed the tubular round columns will allow us to keep a reasonably small cross-sectional dimension on the columns and while we won't have 40 feet of absolute clear when we put the columns 40 feet on center we should expect to have at least 39 feet clear which the client thinks is adequate. The client wants the minimal number of roof apertures that will provide satisfactory uniformity of the illumination across the space. That is, the aperture should be spaced as far as apart as possible, consistent with the requirement that the aperture spacing be close enough to provide uniform illumination on the work plane. For the purposes of this facility, the height of the work plane is chosen to be three feet because there are people mainly working at tabletops and they stand to do their work very much as we might do in architecture when we stand to do drawings at a drawing board. So we're going to design and draw the section through the roof at the interior of the building indicating the height of the glazing above the floor, the daylight glazing, the vertical dimension of the glazing, the horizontal dimension of a typical sawtooth module, and any structural elements 
such as columns, walls, transfer beams, spanning elements, supporting the roof decking, curving below the glazing, etc. We should assume that the north wall is outfitted with view windows from 3 feet up to 8 feet high. The clear, there is clear story glass in the north wall which the top of which is about 20 feet, 1 feet above the floor. We're going to assume the roof of the North Bay is generally flat with a very shallow slope of about 1 quarter inch of rise per foot of run to get positive flow of the water off the roof at the north wall of the building. In other words, we're going to sawtooth all the bays except the North Bay which we're going to try to illuminate through the wall. And this is not an uncommon thing to do. Um, First of all, the sawtooth at the north wall is going to loom really huge and some people don't find that appealing so there's a desire to bring the north wall down a little closer to human scale. But also the presumption is that the north wall uh, is an opportunity to put glass in and if the glass works um, then that's what we should use. So, we're going to draw the section at the north wall showing the vertical dimension of the clear story glazing, the horizontal dimension of the flat portion of the roof above the clear story, any structural elements, and the section of the roof aperture system in the bay just south of the north bay. Based on that detailed drawing, the question is, will light from the clear story glazing in the north wall penetrate penetrate deep enough into the building to satisfy the 40-foot free span requirement. In other words, will it fully illuminate the north bay? And if not, outline and then draw up the options for providing the required light in the north zone. Okay, so this is a kind of a preliminary drawing. I did this fairly quickly and let's go through what the issues are here. First of all, um, I drew a line representing the finished floor. And then I duplicated that down and put some fill here to just kind of clearly delineate where the ground is. Then I offset the line from the finished floor up three feet to identify where the work plane is. I also took that line and I duplicated it up 22 feet and that establishes the point below which no spanning structure should go because we were told that we need 22 feet of clearance to safely get equipment underneath. And in this kind of preliminary way, I said, well, I'm spanning 40 feet, so I made this depth 2 feet, and that represents a beam. And for the moment, I just made it as a solid cross-section. Um, but it would uh, probably be an I-beam. It could possibly be uh, some kind of a rectangular steel tube. But in all likelihood, the most economical and reasonable thing to, be, to make it out of would be a wide flange beam. And in a preliminary kind of way, I've also shown a curb here and projected up some glass. And this then shows a, an open web joist, which is spanning basically from that beam up to the top of a structural mullion and that structural mullion is coming to rest on the um, next beam over. And then we were told on this bay that we were going to try and get by with this, with this wall. And right now, rather than show any dimensions, which haven't been worked out ter terribly carefully, um, I'm going to just show that there's this knee wall up to three feet. Then from three feet up to eight feet is glazing. Then it's opaque. And then there's some um, uh, clear story glass from there up to the top. And you'll notice, by the way, I'm assuming glass is running from the top of this curb very close to the underside of that truss. 
and in fact the glass could even be between the trusses because the decking and the edge angle will span uh, sufficiently to go over the top of that glass. So that allows us to bring glass up very high which is what we want to do because the higher the glass is the further the light spreads and uh, we're always seeking to do that. Now we could put a big old deep beam across the top here but this beam is already deep enough. It's already carrying the ends of these trusses. It can also carry the ends of these trusses and that allows us to avoid putting uh, another beam up at the top here which would be happening at a very uh, strategically disadvantageous location since we really want to have glass up there. Um, I've given this portion of roof some slope um, which was what was called for in this example. Um, in this case for the 40 foot dimension in that direction uh, with a slope of a fall of one quarter of an inch per foot that means that this point right here is 10 inches lower than that point right there. So I've constructed that surface and this is all very preliminary and kind of threw it together really fast um, but now I need to do things a bit more accurately and what I mean by that is I need some mullions top and bottom and it turned out in this example I didn't put enough rigid insulation on the roof uh, and I didn't show the corrugations properly and so this is mainly a picture to kind of get you started so that you have the, the sort of gross picture of what it is we're trying to do. And by the way, you already have a preliminary sense here based on this drawing, which is not terribly accurate, but we can't go any higher than that uh, at this end, given where we had to start at that end. And so when we put in our, our line of slope 1 to 1.5, um, we discover that this primary zone of illumination plus this one are doing fine and by the way the overlap is fine we don't mind an overlap what we don't want is a gap and right here we have a gap uh, between this zone and that zone over here though it's working out pretty well in that this clear story seems to be overlapping the primary zone of, infl of uh, illumination for the next clear story and so to first order we're in pretty good shape so what we're going to do is we're going to try and construct this whole thing a little more accurately and make sure that we got it right so um, in AutoCAD um, I've drawn a wide flange beam 24 inches deep which is two feet which is 40 feet over 20 which we've said is as an as a starting point a fairly reasonable depth of beam to pick i've made it 12 inches wide um, in order to comfortably accommodate a five inch end bearing assembly on both sides so right now what i'm drawing is a kind of conventional uh, detail where a bunch of uh, truss joists are coming to land on um, a solid web girder and this shows the end bearing assembly for each of these trusses. I've also shown decking here which is inch and a half deep decking and I've chosen that on the presumption that we can put these bar joists every um, five or six feet um, along the girder and the inch and a half decking will easily span that distance. Now a really key thing here is I've drawn insulation, rigid insulation. The current code for commercial roofs is R30. So I have put the equivalent of R30 in rigid uh, polystyrene insulation, um, styrofoam, and that would be seven inches deep. Now I've taken that basic concept and redrawn it so I still have the same beam and 
Now, instead of an end bearing assembly on one side, I've put a post. And for the moment, uh, I don't know exactly what these are going to end up being, but I've got a 5 inch deep tubular post, which is structural in nature, which is going up to the top of the structure to carry um, the, uh, the, truss, the trusses that exist on this side. And in fact, there'll be one of these posts for each truss so that we don't need a beam across the top and we can have the maximum uh, daylight penetration. And I drew this 5 inch uh, tubular column, if you will, and then I've shown something on each side of it which might represent uh, sheathing on the outside and sheetrock on the inside. And there probably would be some studs internal to the structure and those studs might dictate what the actual dimension is here. But we're not going to worry about that too much right at the moment, although these are all details that you would need to account for in doing a roof like this. On the other side of this beam, we have the classic end bearing assembly, except now we're going to have this uh, sloped element. And for the moment, I have set it roughly where I think it needs to be in terms of its angle. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that is not just to represent it fairly quickly, but to get some idea of what this depth is. Because in going from this situation to this situation, we've changed that depth a little bit, and we'd like to know what that is. Now, one of the key things to note here is that the dimension does not change between this bearing surface at the bottom of this inverted double angle here. So this is the end bearing assembly. Uh, that dimension does not change um, between that point and this point at the top surface of the top double angle. In other words, we keep that at five inches and we rotate the top cord about that point. So the depth of the end bearing assembly is less there, is more there, but is still five feet here. Now, I haven't drawn it, but we really need to make this end bearing angle deeper in order to fully engage this joint. But for the moment, I've just rotated it. And if I want to, I can imagine, uh, in fact, I'll do it the following way. I'll take this point and go up to there and that point and go up somewhere around there and I'm showing that end bearing assembly now fully engaged. Now you need to understand those dimensions because they're going to affect things like this overall dimension and you have got to get some kind of structure here that goes beyond this point and continues up in order to uh, create a proper curb and a place for water here. So that construction kind of gives you an idea of uh, what's involved uh, in taking a fairly conventional truss like this and using it for this sloped portion of the roof. Okay, so now armed with that information, I'm going to go get this uh, stuff that I drew here, which is not very accurate, and I'm going to get rid of it. And by the way, this will be classic of how you do things in life, is you kind of draw it, you get a sense of what you're dealing with, then you draw it again, and you keep getting better and better, which is, by the way, one of the things that's wonderful about CAD programs is that you can keep massaging things until you get them the way you want them. Whereas in the old days, we used to have to try and visualize extremely carefully what we were doing uh, before we started drawing. Otherwise, we would just sand a hole with our eraser through the paper we worked on. So you can draw something and move it around and do all kinds of things with it, which is one of the beauties to working in uh, a CAD program. Okay, so I'm going to take all that assembly that I created there, and by the way, I still don't know if this slope is the right slope 
but I kind of have a, an idea that it's right in the right ballpark and in fact it's this slope and then I added a little more because I knew there were some things I forgot along the way when I did the original drawing. So now I'm going to duplicate this and I'm going to go from right there down to right here and put that in place. Um, and for the moment I'm going to erase this and anything that's up there because I now have a new working model for how I want to do all of this. Now, in giving assignments like that, this, we want you to be aware that there's a huge amount of water that flows down here towards this wall and you do not want your glass down there. So one of the first things you want to do is build up a curb. And for the purposes of this particular example, we're going to say that whatever this width is that's causing water to come rushing down here, we're going to make this curb some percentage of this horizontal dimension. Now, this curb also needs to be influenced by the climate. What kind of deluge of rain are you likely to have? It also needs to be informed by how far the water has to go in this trough before we take it off. So we're not giving you any really super scientific rule here because there are a lot of variables that have to be accounted for, but we are telling you the following, that we would like the height of this wall above the insulation to be 0 0.8, in other words, 8% of whatever this horizontal dimension is. So if in fact the horizontal dimension is 40 feet and we want to be 0.08 of that, we're at 3.2 feet, which is uh, 38 inches. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to draw a line that starts right there. And I'm going to choose my offset function and I'm going to put 38 inches and offset that upwards. So now once I've done that, that tells me that my curb better go that high. So that's, that's where it is. And by the way, it's not a bad idea. Uh, if you have any doubts, to make that a little bit deeper. But I'm putting this here to make sure we got it right. So, 40 feet times 0.08 is 3.2 feet. And that converts, I didn't get that right. You're not paying attention. It was close though. All right, so let's go do that in Excel just to illustrate the point. So we got, 0.08 we've got 40 feet and then I'm going to do this times 12 inches so I'm going to say equals this times that times that and I actually get 38.4 inches and Normally, I don't encourage you to be really sloppy and slovenly, but just to make sure, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to delete that. And I'm going to delete that. And, you know, I don't know what this dimension is going to end up exactly due to this tilting process. So I'm going to be a little conservative, and I'm going to make that 40 inches. Instead of 38.4 I'm going to offset it 40, and that way I won't be quite so nervous about water piling up uh, near my window. So, I'm going to take this, and I'm going to fill up to there, and that is the height of my curb. And by the way, that's the opaque portion that gets properly waterproofed around this edge. The um, 
the tube that's inside there needs to continue on up. So if I were uh, doing this appropriately, I just would indicate all that continuing up. Uh, and to avoid any kind of confusion, you might even want to uh, draw a section through there. and eliminate that just so we understand that that vertical element is continuous. Now I'm going to turn right around and contradict myself because I'm going to now say we're going to draw a sill in there. And typically a sill has got to be a few inches deep and I think we're going to make it uh, 2.5 and just say that uh, we've got some kind of mullion, horizontal mullion or whatever there, and the glass goes down into that. And there's a whole science to how that thing ought to be designed, but for right now we're going to just say we think we can do it with two and a half inches. So now we're finally up to where the bottom of the glass starts. So we need to know the vertical dimension of the glass. So we're going to go back to Excel and mess around a little more here. Um, we're going to say that the horizontal dimension of the glass is the following. It is equal to 0.9 times 40. And the reason we're saying equal to 0.9, come on, you don't need to do that to me. We're saying it's 36 feet. And the reasoning is the following. We know that we've got these vertical tubes. We know that they're about five by five. We know that they're going to obscure maybe 10% of um, the glazing area. And as a consequence, um, we're, and by the way, the, the bays are 40 by 40. So these uh, sloped trusses need to be some nice modular dimension. So they could be 5 feet, which is 60 inches. Um, and that's not a bad, look, bad uh, configuration because the glazing could easily be 5 feet wide. That's a nice dimension that doesn't require really thick glass. So let's go with that. We'll say we have a 60 inch modular spacing our vertical columns are five inches. So five inches uh, divided by 60 uh, is less than 10%, but then there's off-axis light and things of that sort. So we're just going to say 10% of the horizontal dimension is obscured by a mullion. So that leaves us with 36 feet. Now, the area of floor is equal to 40 times 40. And I keep hitting the wrong keys here. So we have 1,600 square feet. The area of the glass is going to equal 0.2 times the area of the floor because that's our 20% ratio. And then the dimension vertical of the glass is now going to equal that area divided by the horizontal dimension. Well, So it's 8.88 and 
I'm working in inches in AutoCAD so I'm going to convert that so I can do my offset so I'm going to multiply times 12 and it says I have to go 106 inches and because I'm such a generous guy I'm going to go 107 now actually if we went 108 that would be exactly nine feet that's a nice round number so we're going to round this up to 108 inches so now I'm going to go back to AutoCAD and I'm going to say this mullion right now needs to be offset 108 inches upward So we are beginning to see that the original construction of this thing wasn't terribly accurate. So I'm going to delete all that. And now I can take this and I can say we're going to project these up to that. And now I'm going to do a little offset here that says uh, There's our glass. And if you want it centered, you can center it, but you've got some kind of flashing issues that need to be attended to down here. And by the way, the glass disappears down here into this sill. And um, for the moment, I'm going to just draw this like this and that like that. And I should show it going down into there and some kind of slope flashing that makes sure we get a water away, but I'm mainly interested in structure right now, so we're not going to do that. Okay. So this is the vertical extent of the glass. And now up above, we would also say that we need at least 2.5 inches of mullion. And maybe more, but for the moment, I think we can get it done with that. And so I'm going to say that glass mullion, in fact, that's not the way we did it down below. Um, So I've got the horizontal mullions bottom and top and of course going up through there and continuing up however high it needs to go is the end bearing assembly. Now this is where things get kind of tricky because um, that end bearing assembly actually exists on top of the columns and the columns are in between these mullion elements. And so the end bearing assembly actually comes down inside of here. So if I did an offset, like so, so I'm going to come and I'm going to say uh, offset five inches. Whoa. Let's not do that. Okay, so I've regrouped for a moment here and erased some other parts of the structure so that I can now take this part right here and duplicate it. So I'm going to go from right there to right there. And now I can draw some snap lines. And one of the things that I've got to figure out is uh, how high I want to go above over at this point. And 
The concerns that we have are that if the end bearing assembly is too wide in one direction, um, it could encroach upon this top horizontal mullion and we don't want that to happen. So I think for the moment to be a little conservative I'm going to uh, behave as if the entire mullion is above that. So in other words I can now come along and say I'm going to offset by 0.5 which is my margin of safety and I can't do that because this somehow I turned this thing into a uh, a polyline but I'm going to offset 0.5 inches which is to give me a little room for error and that becomes where the end bearing assembly is going to come off and then I'm going to offset that by 5 inches so that I do this and that's where the top of the end bearing assembly is going to come to so um, and while I'm doing it, I'll just say I'm going to offset 2.5 here and here. So that's the width of the end bearing assembly, which is sitting right on top of the column. And this portion right here could actually be um, a bearing plate uh, on the top of the column. So I'm going to take this right here and I'm going to project this over and then I'm going to take this right here draw it right there and eliminate this and now this will go over there and this is that top plate and for the moment I'm going to just erase something here which is that little stub right there Okay, so what I want to do now, having done that, and by the way, to give you a reason why I wouldn't have wanted to do that, if I can get all this end bearing assembly down between this horizontal mullion, I'm reducing the overall height of my building. By drawing it up here, I'm now going to have to fill in this gap uh, with some kind of insulation and some kind of structure. I would have preferred not to have a higher building and not to have the cost associated with filling that in but I am deeply concerned that a 40-foot truss is likely to have angles that are too wide to fit down between these mullions. So we're going to draw them up above there and here's what we're going to do now. We're going to take a line and we're going to start right here at the top of that and we're going to snap that line up to right here and that becomes the top of the top cord for this truss. So you'll notice I seem to have drawn this truss a little bit steep uh, but we'll be able to rotate that down in a second. So we now have vertical glass. It's as tall as we need it. We have mullions top and bottom. We have an end bearing assembly up there. And now all the structure is going to extend out a bit. And we'll figure out what that's going to be. But this is the slope of the top of the top cord. So while I have it on my mind, I'm going to take those two lines and I'm going to move them up to there. So they're supposed to start at the top of the glass framing. In other words, at the very top of the glazing itself and project down from there. And then I'm going to take this and I'm going to project these lines downward. So I know where the primary zones of illumination are. And I'm going to eliminate this one because this was left over 
from some previous diagram that was not very accurately drawn. So we're going to zoom in here for a second and we're going to do some offsets. The uh, top cord of this 40 foot truss is likely to be at least two inches deep, probably 2.5. So I'm going to say I'm going to do an offset. And I'm going to say 2.5 inches. And I'll do like that. And that's the top cord of that truss. And then I'm going to offset about 20 inches because typically roof trusses are L over 24. So L over, let's go run those numbers for a moment. Here we are back in Excel and the span is 40 feet. And this would be 40 divided by 24. And then I'm going to multiply by 12 to convert it to inches. And I get 20 inches. So I'm going to come back to my AutoCAD drawing and I'm going to select the offset function. And I hit 20. And I'll offset that. And that's the typical depth of the truss. And now I'm going to come to the offset function. I'm going to say 2.5. And go that way. So now the overall depth of that truss is going to be 20 inches. And the depth of each of these cord members is 2.5. Now, of course, I need to pull all this back in some way. And one of the things I'll do is, you don't know this yet, but um, the overall distance from the top cord to the centroid in this case is going to be about one inch. So I'm going to offset that about an inch. And I'm going to draw that as a center line. Like so. And that gives me my working point there. And that means my diagonal web has got to come down somewhere like this. And just to make sure that diagonal is going to be like one and a half. So I'm going to do an offset of 0.75 real quick just to see if I'm clearing. And I am clearing uh, this base point for my end bearing assembly. And actually that end bearing assembly would have a little offset like that. So I've got all that geometry working and down here I'm going to just trim this off in some way to clean it up. And uh, the precise detailing would not look like this but for what we're doing, uh, we're going to say this is good enough. So now we can go zoom in on this. And we need to uh, rotate this whole structure here. So I'm going to try to do that. And I'm going to go select all of that. And then I'm going to deselect the parts that I don't want to, uh, to actually rotate. So we're going to take all that and we're going to say rotate. And we're going to rotate, by the way, about that point right there. So we're going to say rotate. And let's see if I can do this without...
Okay, so there you go. And uh, this part right here, we're going to just pull back a little bit and trim it off. Just so we understand that this stuff flying around here doesn't just keep going on forever. So, we basically would fill in some web members here and we also want to transport some of this insulation and decking up to the top and create some detail up there that makes sense. And by the way, there is no interference between that line and that truss because all this light is moving between the trusses. Um, so you would go about doing that and uh, I'm going to eliminate all of this stuff and go transport. the following. First, let me make sure that I've eliminated this stuff, which I don't want there. And now I'm going to come back here. And I'm going to select all of that and all of this and all of that and I can ignore that if I want to and now I want to take all of that and duplicate between right there and right there So now I have my standard sawtooth worked out uh, and you'll notice they're overlapping here. So the next step will be to work out the details of this bay, but we know for sure already that we've got this dark zone. So our options in life are to either fill in this dark zone with electric lighting, which is contrary to our general philosophy that we're trying to get everything done using natural energies. Um, the other option is we can just put another sawtooth up here and then that sawtooth will overlap this one and we'll be fine. We'll just have this very tall um, facade that will have to be braced against wind load and things of that sort. Um, or the other option is we can take this whole thing and move it inward until that point on that triangle goes there. In other words, I could imagine moving this until we get right there and then we just say we're going to have a smaller bay here. Now, to do that really legitimately, I need to redraw it in detail because now I can get the glass to go higher but that's such a fine point that we wouldn't normally even worry about that we'd know that we're pretty good in terms of the uniformity of light here I'm going to undo that for a moment um, because this drawing is not even very well done in terms of the details of this truss work. So that gives you a pretty good idea of what's involved in constructing something like this. Now on your project, um, you're going to be given a library in Western North Carolina where it's quite a bit cooler 
and where passive heating is a desirable feature. So you're going to be asked to uh, face your sawtooth south. That means there will be an overhang on your sawtooth. So the detailing of whatever goes on up here will be a bit more complicated in that there'll be a top cord extension um, that you will have to show. And also these lines get constructed from the uh, lower edge of the overhang. So you will have a different condition that you need to deal with there. And uh, here's another little number to help you calibrate yourself. Um, this is not a universal number. It's not a guideline, but it gives you uh, an order of magnitude sense of something. So we're going to look at this angle and we're going to say that the first order, that slope, is about 20 degrees. Now, that slope will change if you have a situation where you feel like this curb needs to be deeper. And by the way, in this trough, there will typically need to be a cricket that gives you positive runoff. Um, you might have a situation where you need higher light levels, in which case the glazing might go higher. So that number can change um, depending on circumstances. But actually, I think that 20 degree number is pretty close to what you would like to have. So that concludes our discussion of this particular design problem.